Okay, this is a brief outline of my presentation. So basically, I want to talk about intracellular DNA sensing. That's the main topic. Um, but I will start first with some introductory words on innate immunity, which probably doesn't need a great deal of introduction to you. Nevertheless, just a few uh, oops, uh, words on this here. And then I will focus quickly on nucleic acid sensing. The SIGA sting axis, which was discovered in the past two, three years as a very important sensing mechanism in the cytoplasm detecting DNA, talk about how the system works to amplify its activation across different cells, and uh, then draw some comparisons to the OIS-like receptor family that you probably uh, remember from the older days. They get now a little bit back into fashion given the fact that there's an interesting overlap to the CGAS system. And then I talk about the in-trans signaling of CGAM. Okay. So before I start, just a few uh, terminologies here. So we work on innate immunity, and we're interested in how the system functions to perceive the presence of non-self. That's the main question we're trying to answer or trying to understand. And this is, as you know, achieved by a so-called pattern recognition receptor system. So these are receptors that are expressed on immune cells. They're quite conserved. They're germline encoded, and they detect so-called micro-associated molecular patterns as foreign. These can be, for example, cell wall components from bacteria, or certain components from fungi, but also nucleic acids derived from viruses, but also bacteria and also um, parasites that are then sensed by these receptors and trigger immune responses. Now, at the same time, there is an overlap uh, for this system in also sensing endogenous danger-associated molecular patterns. This term was coined to make it analogous to the term here, MAMP, microbe associated molecular patterns, and this is danger or damage-associated molecular patterns. And these are molecules that are released from cells that are dying or tissues that are stressed. And they can trigger very similar receptors. And sometimes there's an exquisite overlap for these two worlds in activating these receptors. And this is especially true for nucleic acids, for example, that can be both derived from pathogens, but also derived from endogenous sources. Now, um, pattern recognition receptors, as you know, when they're engaged, they activate signal transduction cascade. They lead to de novo gene expression. That's a typical trait we're looking at if you look at a microarray, for example. But you also have to uh, keep in mind that they can also activate cascades you might not see in a PCR or in a microarray, which can be proteolytic cascades. They can activate caspases, for example, inflammasome pathway. They co can also activate pathways like phagocytosis or autophagy. They can also be governed by pattern recognition receptors. And in a simple scheme, they feed back on the pathogen and try to get rid of the pathogen, those effective mechanisms. Usually this is not working only in a cell autonomous fashion, but also involving lots of other steps in between, Adap uh, adaptive immunity, obviously. But in a very simple scheme, this could be a single cell that is sensing a pathogen and gets rid of the pathogen in the end. And this scheme uh, sets um, pattern recognition receptors as we understand them as people working in immunology, apart from restriction factors that exert direct restriction on something they sense. Because these factors can also sense uh, certain patterns as non-self. If you think about IFID proteins that also detect, for example, certain types of RNAs, but we don't consider them at, as pattern recognition receptors because these proteins do not engage signaling cascades and do not exert effects that are distant from the receptor themselves. Now, another important uh, point to keep in mind that even though the way you learn it in textbooks and how it was initially thought that pattern recognition receptors detect non-self is not entirely true. This might be true for certain nucleic acids, for certain cell wall components, for example. LPS is a true non-self pattern. But there's good examples that these receptors also respond uh, to molecules that are just shielded away from the receptors. So this is not really true non-self sensing, but it's more of a non-self um, compartment sensing. And this is especially true for nucleic acid sensing. A lot of receptors uh, that have evolved to sense viral nucleic acids or bacterial nucleic acids can also respond to endogenous nucleic acids, those damp molecules. And the reason they don't do it under steady state conditions is because they're not uh, in the same compartment as these nucleic acids. So there's no nucleic acid sensing receptors um, that respond to normal DNA in the nucleus, for example, or in the mitochondria. And they're shielded away from these receptors. Now, the fact that nucleic acids um, trigger innate immune responses is actually quite old. Um, this is a publication from the 1960s. This is briefly after the discovery of type 1 interference by Isaacs and Lindenmann. 
And um, just six years later, um, they published this paper here. This is actually Isaacs. Um, that you can trigger antiviral immunity by taking nucleic acids and treating cells with those nucleic acids. And what they show here, this is a very unorganized table, obviously, but this is how it was published at that time, that you can take different nucleic acids, treat, um, in this case, um, I think, chick cells, and then they added a virus on these cells and um, just counted the plugs as a measure of antiviral activity. And what they saw is that by taking red liver DNA, they could decrease the plaque counts, not tremendously. Here, this is mouse cells. This is 90 plaques, roughly 90 to 80, and here we're 78 to 69. So it's not very strong, but it could uh, decrease plaque counts. And even more so effective was double-stranded RNA, poly-IC, for example. You probably know all poly-IC. It's a long double-stranded RNA mimic made up of poly-I, poly-C, made into a double-stranded uh, nucleic acid molecule. And this was for many decades the mainstay of inducing type 1 interferon. It's a very potent activator of type 1 interferon. And somehow people forgot about DNA being a very potent stimulus um, because poly -IC just took over the field and was used for many fields in the field as a very strong activator of, of antiviral immunity. Now you know that uh, pattern recognition receptors were then discovered in the mid-1990s. It all started with the discovery of Toll in Drosophila, for which uh, Jules Hoffmann later got the Nobel Prize. And then it turned out that there's toll homologs in the mammalian system, toll like receptors, that sense a certain uh, of these mic microbe associated molecular patterns as non self, TLA4, for example, LPS, but also toll like receptors that sense nucleic acids. TLA3, for example, a very good uh, receptor to respond to long double stranded RNA, including poly IC. And for example, nucleic acid uh, sensing receptors in endolysosomal compartments like TLA789 which are in the endolysosome, sensing um, RNA and DNA. And as it turned out, there's a backup system to the toll pathway system in the cytoplasm, uh, for example, for nucleic acids. MDA5 is a cytosolic RNA helicase that uses a different signal transduction cascade, MAPs, to activate these transcription factors, IL3, nf cover b MAP kinase, that binds to long double-stranded RNA, like poly IC, uh, again, which is a typical non-self structure. It's long double-stranded RNA. And on the other hand, RIG-I, which senses short double-stranded RNA with certain 5' prime signatures, namely 5' prime triphosphate RNA signatures as a non-self structure and triggers the activation of these transcription factors. However, a field that has long uh, been uh, wondered about and a little bit neglected in the beginning, but it was rediscovered then in the 2000s is how is DNA actually sensed in the cytoplasm? I already showed you that there's endolysosomal sensing of DNA by TLA9 in this uh, slide here, uh, this overview, overview slide here. But it turned out that TLA9, even though it's quite prominently expressed in, in, in murine myeloid cells, for example, that it's quite restricted to certain cell types in the human system, plasma cytotic dendritic cells, for example, and, 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 and B cells, and that still a lot of cells that are TLA9 um, negative still responded to DNA. So you could still activate cells that did not express TLA9 or TLA9 knockout mice could still respond to DNA. A classic example that a lot of people did, but it was a little bit underreported, is if you transfect plasmid DNA into cells, you could trigger antiviral immunity just due to the fact that the DNA was transported into the cytoplasm, but also DNA viruses, bacteria replicating in the cytoplasm and so forth. Now, what's the mechanism behind this cytosolic DNA sensing that leads to antiviral immunity? Now, to make a long story short, what people found uh, is a molecule they named Sting that is located at the ER uh, through a cDNA overexpression screen. So what they did is they screened cDNA libraries for factors that would induce type 1 interferon on its own, overexpressed it, and then looked for the transactivation of a reporter construct um, here. This is just a luciferase assay where they used the interferon beta promoter that would be transactivated. And if they overexpressed this molecule they named Sting, they would see a very strong induction of type 1 interference just by overexpressing it. This is also the way Rig I was initially found, a very classic approach to find new molecules in, in transactivation screens. Now, Sting turned out to be a molecule located at the ER. It had four uh, transmembrane domains at the N-terminal part. This is hex cells expressing sting. You see nice uh, ER localization here um, in red and green overlap. It's not at the mitochondria, not at the Golgi under steady state. 
And it turned out, and that's why I bring it up, that sting is absolutely required for DNA recognition. If you knock out sting, and this is MEFs, and challenge these cells, now with all types of DNAs, uh, you see that uh, type 1 different production is dramatically uh, knocked out. There's one exception. This is this exception here. This is long, double-stranded, AT-rich DNA, poly DADT DNA, which activates a different pathway that is independent of sting next to its activation of sting. And this is poly IC, old, old uh, known factor, double-stranded RNA activating TLA3 and MDF5. Now, what is a sting doing with the DNA? Is it a direct DNA receptor? Um, so this is the discovery of sting. Um, didn't really make sense because it didn't really look like a DNA binding protein. And the C-terminal portion of sting, people figured out, would stick into the cytoplasm. The transmembrane regions would tether to the ER. But how would this couple to DNA wasn't really clear. It didn't really have a DNA binding domain. However, as it turned out, sting was a direct receptor for cyclic dinucleotides. Um, cyclic dinucleotides are molecules that are made by bacteria as second messenger molecules. For example, here, cyclic DGMP, cyclic DAMP, AMP, GMP. So purine uh, nucleotides that are linked by phosphodiester bonds, three prime, five prime linkage here of the ribose ring. Here's the, the basis. And they uh, regulate a, diff a lot of different processes in bacteria virulence, biofilm formation, motility, and so forth. They are not present in our cytoplasm, so they're really classic MUMP or PUMP molecules that would be sensed by pattern recognition receptors. And as it turned out, those cyclic dinucleotides directly bind to sting. This is now the crystal structure of sting, which was then solved a couple years after its initial discovery. So sting is at the ER, a preformed dimer, looks like a flower, and in the middle, uh, there's a binding pocket where this little cyclic dinucleotide will sit. So this is one cyclic dinucleotide molecule. It's a symmetric molecule, and by its symmetry, it coordinates those two uh, portions of sting that come together at the ER. It's already preformed, but upon binding to this ligand, it undergoes a slight uh, rearrangement and conformation and recruits uh, TBK1 and activates antiviral immunity. Now, this brings me back to my initial statement why I, I bring this up. Uh, we tried to find the receptor for cyclic dinucleotides uh, uh, together with uh, uh, Miguel from uh, Mauro Giacca's group by doing an siRNA screen, but the problem we had is that the siRNA um, targeting sting was not in the library. It was an old library that didn't uh, have sting uh, as a target molecule because sting it was initially annotated as transmembrane protein 173. Um, so it was one of those awkward proteins that you don't have in the primary siRNA libraries. So that was really tough for us. We found all the positive controls, but we didn't find sting because it was not uh, in the library. Otherwise, we could have uh, seen maybe the same. So this made a lot of sense. OK, it's a direct receptor at the ER that is sensing cyclic dinucleotides. But how would this also sense DNA? That was the big question, and nobody could really give a proper answer. There was a lot of publications that came up with models how other molecules could be upstream of sting bringing DNA to sting and so forth. But um, the clear solution came um, by the group of James Chen by a really heroic uh, biochemical approach, um, which was published in, in late 2012 by identifying an enzyme, uh, which uh, James Chen dubbed C-gas, namely an enzyme that in the cytoplasm detects DNA. Upon DNA binding, undergoes a conformational switch starts to produce a second messenger molecule using ATP and GTP. And this second messenger molecule is very similar to the bacterial cyclic dinucleotides, cyclic GMP, AMP, that then binds to sting and activates sting. So this was really a beautiful uh, solution to this big problem of how could uh, sting be a DNA receptor and cyclic dinucleotide receptor because there's another molecule being upstream of sting that responds to DNA and makes the cyclic dinucleotide that then activates sting. And this turned out to be the first metazone cyclic dinucleotide, very similar to the prokaryotic cyclic dinucleotides. Also, uh, phosphodiester linkages of two ribose rings and the two bases, so it's a mixed one with GMP and AMP. Now, is this important? It is if you knock out sting or C gas and this is data from James Chen's group uh, from his publication, and look at type 1 interferon production again, take cells and stimulate them with HSV or vaccinia virus, you see that type 1 interferon production is completely wiped out. 
uh, so the sea gas knockout is a phenocopy of the sting knockout. It behaves exactly the same. Uh, the exception is obviously this here. This is a, an RNA virus, sender virus, that activates the rig eye pathway. And if you take CGAMP, the second messenger, it's only dead in the sting knockout because the receptor is missing, but it's not dead in the sea gas knockout because it's one step upstream. So we did the same experiment, knocking it out in the human system. So this is a sting uh, and uh, sea gas deficient THP1 cells that we generated using the CRISPR-Cas9 system. This is MAPS as a control. So MAPS, as you remember, is the signaling molecule that is utilized by RIG-I in MD5 to sense RNA. Uh, MAPS knockouts do not respond to RNA. This is triphosphate RNA as it's made for, uh, by negative strand RNA viruses. They don't sense it anymore. This is uh, double-stranded DNA. Still works in the MAPS knockout. Sting knockout is dead for DNA, but still works for RNA. And the sea gas is a phenocopy of the sting knockout. So it's exactly the same in the human system. Now, and this made a lot of sense in retrospect, given the fact that um, sea gas was initially identified in a cDNA expression screen um, by Charlie Rice. Unfortunately, I'm missing the reference here. So this is a paper from the group of Charlie Rice where they uh, tested a lot of different uh, cDNAs, namely type 1 interferon-induced genes. They're overexpressed in different cell lines, here, Hu7 cells, for example, or fibroblasts, and then used these cells and infected them with different viruses, HCV, HIV, uh, yellow fever virus, and so forth, and looked if they would find any cDNAs that would inhibit viral replication or even enhance it. And at that point, a lot of molecules were found that would induce type 1 interference themselves, for example, IF1, RIG I, here again, IF1, IF1, here, TNF receptor, uh, IF2, RIG I, IF7. So lots of molecules were found that would transactivate uh, probably type 1 interferon in these cells. Now, at the same time, they often also found this molecule, C6 of 150, C6 of 150 here, here, here. And as it turns out, this is C gas. And this is C gas they initially identified. And what happened in these screens um, is that C gas overexpression induced type 1 interferon and thereby restricted the replication of these viruses. Uh, which in retrospect, uh, retrospect, as I said, uh, makes a lot of sense. Now, we were interested, obviously, in this as well. We had already uh, known about this publication by Charlie Rice. As, as such, we already had the cDNA encoding for sea gas in our fridge. We overexpressed it right after the paper by James Chen came out. We initially hadn't seen any activity of sea gas by itself because we had used 293 T cells to study sea gas, or C6 of 150 and uh, 293 T cells miss sting. And if you overexpress C gas without sting, you don't see anything because you're missing the receptor for C GAMP. <coughs> but okay, when this came out, we obviously jumped on this as, as a lot of people did uh, because this was really a fantastic novel discovery. We overexpressed C gas in 293 T cells um, and got crude lysates from the cytoplasms of these cells and uh, subjected them to HPLC, the lower molecular weight fraction. And we tried to set up an assay to measure CGAMP using this approach. This should be possible because you should be able to resolve those nucleotides in HPLC. And, and this is uh, the profiles that we get. So in gray, in light gray, you see the cell lysate without anything. The dark blue is the cell lysate that we used uh, and spiked with synthetic CGAMP that we could buy from a company that just after a few months when the James Chen papers came out um, um, offered this as a synthetic source for CGAMP and found it here, okay, we found it in HPLC, so we were happy. However, when we overexpressed sea gas in light blue in 293Ts, we also uh, saw a peak that was quite specific and always came up, but it came up at a completely different position than the synthetic CGAMP molecule. <laughs> now this was puzzling. Uh, we contacted the company, asked them, so what's wrong with the CGAMP that you made? Is it really CGAMP? And they said, no, it's CGAMP. It's phosphodiester linked 3'5 prime, 3'5 prime, as suggested, um, should work. And we ran a lot of different assays. We did biological assays, so we fractionated these two peaks again from the HPLC and used them to stimulate the cells. They both were immune stimulatory. This is an interferon activity assay in, in murine cells that are uh, sting competent, so it worked. Now, to make a long story short, uh, using a lot of different approaches, what we found out is 
there was a tiny bit difference between the molecule we had expected and the one we actually found. And this tiny difference was the fact that the molecule we found in those fractions had a different phosphodiester linkage. It had a two prime, five prime phosphodiester linkage between the G and the A, and not a three prime, five prime linkage, as the bacterial cyclic dinucleotides do. The, different, uh, the other phosphodiester linkage um, between A and G was again three prime, five prime, as expected. So it had a very unusual mixed phosphodiester linkage of two prime, five prime, three prime, five prime. This is the bacterial one. You hardly see the difference if you don't really pay attention uh, here, for example, um, it's really d difficult to see at, at first sight. Now, the same was discovered um, uh, by other groups as well at the same time. And what we could also show in our assays is um, that the precursor molecule that is uh, made by C-gas before it's made into the cyclic dinucleotide is a linear dinucleotide. And namely, uh, the precursor molecule is this molecule here, PPP GP 2 prime 5 prime A. So if you take an HPLC profile of uh, C gas incubated with DNA and ATP and GTP in vitro, you will pick up C GAMP with the 2 prime 5 prime linkage, this molecule here, but you feel, will also pick up a couple other linear dinucleotides, and this is the only possible precursor, because those linear dinucleotides, even if you make them circular, they will not give rise to uh, the GP 2 prime 5 prime, AP 3 prime 5 prime. Um, and to really validate this hypothesis, uh, what we did is we made those two molecules synthetically. So these are now synthetically generated linear dinucleotides, PPP, GP, 2 prime, 5 prime A. And this would have been the other possibility, PPP, AP, 3 prime, 5 prime G, and the second linkage would be 2 prime, 5 prime. But the only precursor is this one here, because only this one here is made into the C-GAMP molecule with the 2 prime, 5 prime, 3 prime, 5 prime linkage. So this is the true precursor of C-GAMP, this linear PPP, GP, 2 prime, 5 prime A. Now, you might look at me now, it's Friday afternoon. Who really cares about this? Why should I care if this is 2 prime, 5 prime, 3 prime, 5 prime, whatsoever? I'm not a chemist, I'm a biologist, and I'm interested in the biology. Well, you should care given the fact that human cells do not really properly respond to the 3 prime, 5 prime C-GAMP molecule at least the most common sting uh, variant. This is human fibroblasts. However, they do respond to the 2 prime 5 prime C-GAMP. Neuron cells, and that's really interesting, they respond to both the 3 prime 5 prime and the 2 prime 5 prime C-GAMP molecule. So this is a big difference, and that's why it's really important um, um, that this is a different molecule. For various reasons, first of all, in general, to have insight into biology, and, and second of all, if you at some point want to develop this molecule in, in some therapeutic approach, uh, you should definitely go for this molecule and not for the 3 prime 5 prime linked one. Now, C-gas is actually part of a bigger family of receptors. Um, as it turns out, um, there's five molecules that are quite similar to C-gas. That's the systematic nomenclature. Um, they have a so-called MAP21 domain. Uh, as such, they're called MAP21 domain containing proteins. This is MAP21 domain containing one. There's a D2. And there's like one, like two, like three. This is a, the so-called MAP21 family. And they are quite similar to the OIS family that I mentioned in the beginning. And those are proteins that have been extensively studied in the late 70s, 1980s, as molecules that detect double-stranded RNA. And I will uh, show you in a couple of slides uh, what it actually does. They're not only similar um, if you compare them with a linear protein uh, uh, sequence, but they also are also quite similar in protein structure. If you compare OIS and CGAS, for both these proteins, they are crystal structures. Um, they both have two lobes, as you see them here. They have a catalytic center in the middle where the cyclic dinucleotide is made by CGAS, and the product of OIS, which I will show you quickly, is made also. Um, they also undergo an allosteric switch upon binding to the double-stranded nucleic acids. The difference for OS is that they respond to double-stranded RNA and not double-stranded DNA. We know that C-gas makes a dimer upon activation. So there's two DNA molecules and two C-gas molecules that are um, a, a complex that is the active um, enzyme complex. 
For ORS, it has been published that ORS works as a monomer, so a single double-stranded RNA molecule and a single ORS molecule. This might, however, not be entirely clear, so I think there will be need, uh, needed, uh, we need uh, future studies to really clar clarify if this works as a monomer. So it could also be the case that ORS works a dimer, as, as a dimer as well. Now, ORS enzymes um, are quite similar given the fact that they also make a 2 prime, 5 prime linked second messenger molecule. So just the way CGAS uses uh, its catalytic center to make a 2 prime, 5 prime linked second messenger, uh, ORS1 does the same. However, those molecules are linear. They're not cyclic and they're longer. So it's 2 prime, 5 prime linked oligoadenylate. So it's ATP bas basically as a substrate that is made into very long chains of 2 prime, 5 prime linked oligoadenylates. They can be up to 10 uh, uh, um, ATP molecules long. They both work in, in a template independent fashion. It's a 2 prime, 5 prime linked second messenger. And uh, the OAS system also exerts activity on one specific pathway uh, it doesn't have a receptor like Sting at, at the ER, but it activates an enzyme called RNase L that forms a dimer upon ligand binding, and upon ligand binding it becomes active and starts to cleave RNAs. And it is believed that this exerts antiviral activity um, due to the fact that this might inhibit uh, the host protein translation by cleaving host RNA, but also cleaving viral RNAs. But it's not entirely clear. The RNase L knockout doesn't have a very strong phenotype. As such, uh, it got a little bit out of fashion in, in the past years um, to study OS systems. Uh, but there might be more effects um, to it. Um, it's not entirely clear. So here are the two pathways again, CGAS system, OS system, um, the similarities, but also the differences. Um, as I said, the dimer formation might not be really a difference. Uh, the need, we need future studies to really clarify this. The second messengers that are made are different. Nevertheless, it's quite peculiar that they're both 2 prime, 5 prime linked. And the other difference is that CGAS has a zinc loop um, here on its spine structure. This is the part that interacts with the nucleic acids. And the zinc loop is very uh, important um, to check whether the double-stranded nucleic acid that is, um, well, trying to activate CGAS is really double-stranded DNA. So double-stranded RNA cannot bind to CGAS or cannot effectively bind to CGAS inducing uh, enzymatic activity because the zinc loop um, checks the difference, which OAS doesn't have. So this is just some other similarities at the biochemical level. I think we can skip this. This is just showing that uh, the syn synthesis of the two prime, five prime linkage is very similar between the two systems. Okay, so back to this branch now. Um, so uh, all the enzymes here marked in blue uh, have enzymatic activity. Uh, for these, it's not studied. Um, in the OS family, there's three of them that do have enzymatic activity, OS1, 2, 3. Um, there's an OS-like, which lost its enzymatic activity, but still has a function in antiviral immunity. For the others, it's not clear. Um, it's possible that this one has enzymatic activity as well, but it hasn't been studied yet. So the question obviously is, is, is there a common ancestor to those two families? And that's possible. It hasn't been studied in great detail. Nevertheless, if you look into the databases, you will find that there's probably a common ancestor in, uh, for the CGAS family in early vertebrate evolution. Here's, for example, in Lancelet, there's a CGAS-like molecule. And the important features are the presence of this zinc thumb, which is important for double-stranded DNA recognition and the presence of um, those amino acid residues that are important for catalytic activity. And this is Drosophila, for example, which might have a CGAS-like one, but it's missing this uh, zinc thumb here, which is kind of interesting. So I think it's going to be uh, worthwhile to study this in the future. At this point, we're not really sure how they evolved and how they co-evolved actually with Sting, because Sting is required to exert the antiviral activity of CGAS. Um, but it's quite likely that they do share common uh, ancestors, those two families. Now, back to the, the signaling. So CGAS, as I showed you, is an enzyme that makes this molecule CGAMP that activates Sting. So this is a classical second messenger. What are second messengers good for? They're good for integrating a lot of different inputs. And that's usually the case. If you think about CAMP or CGMP or calcium influx, there's usually lots of out, uh, upstream inputs that will induce the activation of those second messengers. 
And usually they have pleiotropic effects. So I don't know, calcium influx not only exerts one activity, but it does often uh, do many different things. Now with the CGAS system, it's different. Uh, at this point, uh, the only clear effector function of CGAMP is the activation of sting. Even though there are reports of uh, sting independent effects of CGAMP, they need a little more uh, further validation. Uh, if you take sting knockout cells and trigger them with CGAMP, um, they show a very profound defect in activity, indicating that this is really the major effector here. Now, why is that the case? Um, maybe it's because those pathways were initially not really meant for it, uh, each other in, in evolution. Maybe this CGAMP production had a different effector mechanism and then later on hardwired to the activation of sting. And sting was initially a pattern recognition receptor for exogenous dinucleotides. At the same time, they could also have co-evolved. The other possibility is maybe CGAMP does have other effector mechanisms and not by really activating a different pathway in the cell, but activating the same pathway in a different cell. It's a small molecule, so why can't it uh, work just like a, a hormone, like a cytokine, by uh, alarming cells in the vicinity? Now to test this, um, what we tried to do is set up assays where we could study the activation of sting at the single cell level using cells that are usually not um, sufficient for sting and sea gas. And that's actually quite easy given the fact, as I mentioned initially, hex cells do not express sting and they do not express sea gas. So you can nicely complement them just by overexpression. You don't have any troubles uh, as you have it with uh, primary cells like MEFs or macrophages. They usually have both sea gas and sting, so you, it's really difficult to study them um, both separately from each other. So um, what we did, and this is a slide in which you see now sting expressed in a 293T cell with the M cherry tag. Uh, it's a very ugly picture because it's overexposed. And the only point I want to make here that is that you mainly see it in the cytoplasm. It's localized at the ER, but you don't really see it because it's overexposed. But if you activate it, what you see is that it relocalizes sting to a different compartment. It's actually now a perinuclear compartment, and it makes very strong uh, blob structures, as you see here. So this is a big difference from here to here. So at the single cell level, you can actually study sting because it makes a blob structure. Now, what we did then is we took those cells that expressed sting in M. cherry, the red cells. Now you see it's a little bit nicer done because it's confocal picture. This is the ER localization of sting and overexpressed a GFP plasmid. Now, this is a cell that is red and green. You don't see any changes. Those cells are still sting positive and they didn't activate sting. Now, if you take a plasmid that expresses sea gas and is green in addition, you see a green cell here and a green cell here. And now you see this little nice blob structure. It's perinuclear, so you see even a little dent in the nucleus because it's very prominent. Now, at the same time, what you will see is that not only these cells are activated for sting, but also the cells here in the vicinity, these here, these guys, and even over here. So that uh, already alluded to the possibility that the signal of sting activation is not only seen in this cell here, but also traveling to the cells in the vicinity. Now again, to make a long story short, uh, this is an assay we used um, to study the dynamics of this process. We took cells in which we overexpress sea gas to an extent that they constantly make now sea gamp and labeled these cells with calcein, which is a green dye that is very small and diffusible and put these cells on cells that express sting. So those two cells uh, have different components. These guys have sting and these guys have sea gas. And what happens is uh, seen in this movie, maybe I can put this down, just one movie. So this is the cells that are uh, making CGAMP and these are the cells that express sting. Um, you see now lies uh, ER localization. And if I start the movie now, you will see that the green dye is leaking out from these cells into the vicinity. Same is happening here, the movie starts again. And at the same time, what you observe is not only the cells are getting green, but they also start to activate sting. And at the end of the movie, almost everything is sting activated. And especially in the vicinity of those green cells here, here and here, and also down here. This is basically a still image from this movie uh, where you see green cells, um, but they don't make C-GAMP in this case. You see that the green dye is leaking out into the bystanders. 
And here you see the same experiment with the cells overexpressing CGAS, so they make CGAMP, and now you see sting activation in the vicinity. This also translates into a functional activity, and that's a very simple experiment, but I really like it because it's really, I think, revealing. This is, again, the cells that make CGAMP all the time. These are cells that don't express sting. If you mix them together, nothing happens. This is looking at a different beta. And they don't respond because they don't have sting. But now if you mix them with cells that express sting, and remember those two cells are separated from each other, the, the two systems, now the cells start to make interferon. Um, so this translates into functional activity. And this also translates uh, into functional activity if you look at the phosphorylation of IO3. So one step further upstream. Now, how, how does this work? I, I said in this movie, the, the green dye is leaking out. Obviously, we know that uh, stuff is not leaking out of cells. It's very controlled. And you know that cells are connecting to each other using gap junctions, for example. And gap junctions are made up of connections. And those connections form hemichannels, six of them uh, all together. And two hemichannels um, connect to make a full gap junction. There's 20, 21 connections in mouse and man. Uh, they have quite a functional redundancy, which means that not one gap junction is responsible for one molecule and the other one for another molecule. And they can transport all the same molecules. Um, there's homotypic and heterotypic interactions, so connections from one um, class can connect to the other one and so forth. And you can even mix different species together and connect um, connections from different species. Now, a simple experiment to implicate the role of uh, gap junctions is to use a small molecule inhibitor carbenoxalone, which is a very old school uh, classic inhibitor of gap junction mediated transport. Um, you just take it, you take it and put it on cells. And what you can see then if you do this, if you mix now those two cells together again, under normal conditions, you see IF3 phosphorylation. But if you increase uh, carbenoxalone in the cell culture, you see IF3 phosphorylation goes down. This is a positive control. That's a small molecule agonist that goes directly into the cell, doesn't need gap junction, and it works all together even if gap junctions are blocked. And this is the same assay, but now looking at the activation of sting, um, which also goes down. Now, to really provide a genetic proof that it's gap junction mediated, we had to knock out connections. And that's not so straightforward, given the fact that there's redundancy. And initially, we didn't really know what connections are expressed in those hex cells. Um, we were somewhat lucky that they do not express all connections, but the major connections they express are connection 43 and 45. Uh, this we found through microarrays and educated guess searches in the database. So we had two candidates that we could target. And again, to make a long story short, this is what we did. We knocked them out both at the same time using the CRISPR-Cas9 system. These are cells uh, that do not express connection 43 and 45 anymore. Those little extra bands you see are truncated mutants that don't work anymore, and these are the controls. Now, if you take these cells and subject them to the same type of assay that I showed you before, namely the assay where we take cells that are green and express CGAMP, uh, make CGAMP all the time, you see that in the wild type condition where the connections still work, the green dye is leaking out into the sting positive cells, and sting is active. You see those blobs forming. Now, in the cells, in the sting cells in red that now lack functional gap junctions, the dye doesn't travel into these cells anymore, and you don't see sting activation anymore. So this is completely dead if you knock out connection 43 and 45. But the small molecule agonist um, that I showed you before that doesn't need gap junction still works. So this is the positive control. Sting can still be activated under these conditions. And this is just a final slide for this project here to show you that this also is relevant for a true virus recognition system. In this case, what we did is we took a virus that encodes for GFP, namely a replication incompetent vaccinia virus. And this virus, if you take it and put it onto cells that make CGAMP and mix them with cells that are sting positive, you see that the cells that are not infected by the virus uh, will still activate sting. So you see again those blob structures here, which you can uh, quantify here again. So this also has a relevance for true virus sensing. Obviously, uh, we can't provide you uh, data at this point that show you that this really works in vivo. This is really difficult to do. Uh, one way to do it would be to uh, prevent gap junction-mediated transport in vivo, but that's kind of difficult given the redundancies and 
all the side effects you have with uh, blocking gap junctions. Uh, so what we're uh, currently pursuing is we generated a mouse in which Sting is tagged the same way as we tag it here in those hex cells, namely with an mcherry tag. And we hope that using this mouse, we can visualize Sting activation in vivo using two photon imaging. Uh, the mouse is done, but we haven't um, generated any data so far. So we hope that this will be available soon. OK, um, so CGAS is important for DNA recognition, activates Sting. I showed you a lot of data using synthetic DNAs. Um, but when I started to talk about those receptors, initially I said that um, especially nucleic acid sensing receptors can also respond to endogenous um, triggers. And that's quite important given the fact that there's quite a few diseases where this might be the underlying cause for inflammation or autoimmunity. Now, usually we don't have a problem with all those nucleic acids overwhelming the system given the fact that um, we get rid of them by certain nucleases. And there's quite a few sources of nucleic acids. If you think about necrosis, apoptosis, also endogenous sources, there's always the discussion of possible retro elements coming up in the cytoplasm. But usually, we, as I said, we don't have the problem given the fact that we get rid of them um, using certain nucleases that are in different compartments. DNAs1, extracellular compartment, DNAs2, lysosome, TREX1, old name is DNAs3 in the cytoplasm, RNAs H2, cytoplasm, nucleus probably, and they all degrade nucleic acids. And usually um, this suffice um, to get rid of those nucleic acids. But if you lack one of these, uh, you have a problem, and actually a major problem, which tells us that there's no redundancy between those nucle uh, nucleases. So if you have a, a defect in one of these, um, you have a problem um, that you can see in certain disease models or even diseases. And one very prominent model is the lack of TREX1 activity. Um, TREX1 mutations are seen in patients with so-called agardi coutier syndrome. And what you see here is that uh, you have an accumulation of cytoplasmic nucleic acids, mainly DNA. And those nucleic acids, um, since they're not degraded anymore, um, lead to a chronic activation of type 1 interferon production in these patients. Um, the main problem is an early onset progressive encephalopathy that is characterized by spontaneous type 1 interferon production in the CSF. And they also have skin lesions that are very similar, similar to chilblain lupus. So this is a type 1 interferon associated autoimmune disease that is due um, to the over or the excessive, um, not production, but um, yeah, presentation of nucleic acids in the cytoplasm. The source of those nucleic acids is not entirely clear. There's a couple of different hypotheses out there. But um, you can study this also in the murine system. If you knock out TREX1, you also have a multi-organ inflammation. It's different from the patients. So the mice mainly have a myocarditis. But it's also um, driven by type 1 interference. Uh, and this is just a slide that shows you those chilblain lupus lesions that these patients have. Now, what is driving this type 1 interference production? So this is a slide of TREX1 knockout MEFs. When you isolate the cytoplasm from, the me from these MEFs, you see cytoplasmic DNA, which is really amazing. This is just baseline conditions, nothing added in addition. There's no virus. Those cells just have a lot of DNA in the cytoplasm. If you add DNAs1, you can decrease this. So this is mainly DNA, DNA here. And these cells make spontaneous type 1 interferon. This is data we generated, but this has been shown by other groups before in different cells. This is MEFs, this is macrophages, and these are markers of type 1 interferon production, IP10, ISG15. So th these are typical uh, type 1 interferon regulated genes. Now, again, what we hypothesized, and this was not really rocket science, and well, probably it's CGAS that is sensing those DNAs. Now, again, to study this is what we did is we took those MEFs um, that are deficient in TREX1. This is the wild type MEFs. This is the TREX1 knockout MEFs, and knocked out C gas in these MEFs using, again, the CRISPR system. So these are two clones that lack C gas expression. Those clones still have C gas expression. Here we, by accident, generated a truncated version of C gas, which is a little bit um, smaller than the wild type one, but it still works. Because what you see is that these cells, they make spontaneous IP10. No stimulation involved, nothing. Just on their own, they make IP10. But if you now knock out C gas, this is completely wiped out. So it's a C-gas mediated um, recognition of cytoplasmic DNA in this autoimmune disease. Those cells, the, the C-gas knockout cells, they still respond to RIG-I stimulation, 
or they still respond to direct sting activation using, again, the small molecule agonist, so they're um, fine. Um, but they don't make spontaneous IP10 anymore um, because they don't respond to the endogenous DNAs anymore. Now, to really show that this is driven by CGAMP, uh, we wanted to show that CGAMP is made in those tracks one knockout MEFs, um, but it turned out uh, to be really difficult because our HPLC um, didn't really pick it up. It was not sensitive enough, and we could really scale up the, the cell culture a lot more. So what we did is to show this, um, we did mixing experiments again where we took human fibroblasts and mixed them with the uh, Trex knockout MEFs, and by mixing them together, you see IFID2, ISG15, and different beta production in the human fibroblasts now. And those are qPCR primers that only pick up human transcripts. So we don't measure anything in the Trex knockout cells, but in the human cells. Um, and this is C-gas dependent. If you knock out C-gas in those cells, again, this is completely um, wiped out, which indicates, again, the CGAM that is made it here travels to these cells over here and activates antiviral immunity in the human cells. So this is a indirect measure of CGAMP um, being made in these cells. Okay, so in the end, um, just a few words on alternative activation of CGAS. So I think it's pretty clear by the knockout studies from James Chen's group in, in mice, uh, but also the in vitro studies that we did, that CGAS is really the dominant DNA sensor. Um, a lot of other molecules have been proposed. They might also have functions in DNA recognition. Maybe they function in different pathways and maybe in a very cell type specific manner. But in human macrophages and in mouse macrophages and also fibroblasts, CGAS appears to be the dominant DNA sensor. Now, can it do something else? Is it good for RNA recognition um, or other molecules? And one thing we thought about is maybe we should look at RNA DNA hybrids. Um, we said, okay, RNA DNA hybrids are at least made in, in cause of retroviral infection. There's also reports on RNA DNA hybrids showing up in herpes virus uh, life cycle, but also mitochondrial nucleic acids are in, in some part um, um, present as RNA DNA hybrids. As such, we said, okay, let's, let's try to look at these. This turned out to be more difficult than we thought, given the fact that when we take single-stranded RNA and try to make it into RNA-DNA hybrids using reverse transcriptase, we ended up with a lot of DNA, given the fact that at the end, uh, reverse transcriptase um, just displaces the RNA strand and makes double-stranded DNA in vitro. And this is extremely difficult to control, even though you might only have very small amounts of double-stranded DNA, and yet you can never really rule it out as being the functional cause for activity. So what we had to do is we had to take a different model where we just um, took two synthetic or enzymatically generated long polynucleotides, namely poly-RA and poly-DT. We hybridized these together to make them RNA-DNA hybrids. And then we got an antibody that is specific for RNA-DNA hybrids, did a dot plot analysis, and in fact, this molecule is detected as a hybrid. This is double-stranded DNA, it doesn't show up. This can be digested using RNAsH, um, this hybrid, so this also makes sense. Now is it also biologically active? If we transfect this into human PBMCs, we see um, this is the hybrid in dark gray. We see type 1 in different production. It's not as good as double-stranded DNA. It's a different ballpark, but still it does work. This is different donors. It works in THP1 cells. Again, not as good as double-stranded DNA. And this is just a dose titration and that shows the same effect. Now, what's the sensor? Obviously, we started out, out with the hypothesis that we would find something that would be an alternative ligand to C-gas. And in fact, when we knocked out C-gas in THP1 cells, um, hybrids were completely C-gas dependent. So this is, again, the same cells that I showed you before. Now, with RNA-DNA hybrids here um, in light gray, and they work in the MAFS knockout cells, the cells that are dead for RNA recognition but they're completely dead in the C-gas knockout and the sting knockout. And this is, again, the RNA control in dark black here uh, that is independent of C-gas and sting. So hybrids are sensed by C-gas to induce antiviral immunity. Not as good as double-stranded DNA, but they work. Now, do they directly activate C-gas, or is this some indirect mechanism? Or maybe they're converted at least to some part in double-stranded DNA inside the cell. Uh, that could actually be the case. Um, but the good thing about C-gas is 
it being a receptor is, that has enzymatic activity is that you can test these hypotheses in vitro. What you can do is you can take C gas, incubate it with the nucleic acid you're interested in, and then you can do the assay where you look for C GAM production, which is really nice because it directly tells you if C gas responds to the stimulus um, you add in vitro. Now, this is C GAMP in the HPLC profile as a positive control. This is the peak here. This is double stranded RNA plus C gas, poly RA, poly RU. This is the peak. Look at uh, roughly two, you don't see anything here. This is the hybrid, it induces a peak, and this, this is the double-stranded DNA. And this roughly correlates with the um, biological activity. The hybrid is not as good as the double-stranded DNA, but it indeed does activate C gas in vitro to produce C GAMP. So it's a true uh, uh, receptor for hybrids. And this is just another biological assay that shows um, hybrids are active in THP1 cells, for example. And this is just a modeling study. Um, the hybrids do indeed fit into the binding pocket of C-gas, where usually DNA is binding. This is the structure of C-gas bound to DNA. And this is a model where we fit an RNA-DNA hybrid into this binding pocket. And you see uh, it fits nicely into this pocket, whereas double-stranded RNA is really difficult to accom accommodate, given the fact that this zinc thumb is, is sticking out. OK. This is um, the end, and with this I would like to conclude and to summarize these data. So Sting, as I showed you, is an indirect sensor for DNA. Um, it doesn't direct, uh, directly sense DNA, but it senses an unorthodox cyclic dinucleotide that is made by this enzyme C gas, which in a two-step process makes a C GAMP with a, which a 2 prime, 5 prime, 3 prime, 5 prime phosphodiester linkage. And this molecule, and I can show you this in this graphic, um, outline is transfer, for, uh, transferred from the cell where it's made into bystander cells that are in the vicinity through gap junctions. And we think that this could be an important antiviral mechanism to confer antiviral immunity in trans, in cells that have not been infected yet by the virus. So what we envision is uh, a model where a DNA-infected cell, DNA virus-infected cell, could respond to the virus and uh, alarm these neighboring cells that have not been compromised by the virus yet and induce antiviral activity in these bystander cells so that they fit against the DNA virus that might come thereafter. But this, as I said, we need to prove in vivo using true in vivo studies. And finally, um, the ligand spectrum that is sensed by C-gas is mainly double-stranded DNA um, that can be derived of various sources. Um, it's not a sensor that can distinguish between endogenous and exogenous DNA. So if you take DNA from the nucleus or the mitochondria and transfect it into cells, you will activate C-gas. Um, and um, it's not like a pattern recognition receptor like uh, TLA4 that specifically detects only a microbial molecule. The reason why this is not responding to endogenous DNA is it's because it's shielded away from those compartments. And there's enzymes like TREX1 that usually degrade DNAs and get rid of those DNAs. And there's an alternative ligand, namely RNA-DNA hybrids, which can also bind to C-gas and activate it to make C-GAMP to activate STING. And finally, and I didn't show you any data on this, it's very interesting that, and there's already some recent reports that came out, that bacteria that replicate in the cytoplasm of cells seem to mainly activate the C-gas sting axis by uh, DNA being sensed by C-gas and not by providing prokaryotic cyclic dinucleotides, which is, I think, really surprising. I would have guessed that uh, bacteria are mainly sensed through the cyclic dinucleotides uh, being um, transported into the cytoplasm. But it seems that C-gas is also important for this, which is, I think, um, quite intriguing. And with this, I end uh, with the most important slide with uh, thanking the people involved, namely Andrea Ablasser, who did most of the work on, on C-gas and the um, in-trans signaling, Jonathan and Inge, um, Jonathan Schmidtbock, Inge Hemmerling, uh, for generating knockout cells and helping with these studies, um, collaborators in Munich, Kai Peter Hopfner for the crystal structures, and Rune Hartmann uh, for the OS studies, and also my funding sources uh, for supporting our work. And thanks to you for your attention. Thank you.